but you have you know, Dibanjan requested. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Go hopefully ahead. you can see the screen fine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about this work um, in collaboration with my student Meyer and Xavier Wintel uh, from last year, and it's named What Limits the Simulation of Quantum Computers. So uh, to begin with, I'd like to talk about the motivation and uh, the background <coughs> of this work. Uh, basically, it's like trying to explain why we asked ask this question on what limits the simulation of quantum computers. So as many of you might have heard of um, this famous paper from the Google group in uh, 2019, um, they published a nature paper uh, claiming that they have achieved uh, quantum supremacy using their uh, state-of-the-art quantum computing chip named Sycamore. And by quantum supremacy, what they mean is that their uh, quantum computer can perform a task that cannot be finished by uh, quantum computers in a reasonable amount of time. So the task they carried out was uh, to draw samples from random quantum circuits. And uh, just to briefly mention uh, the configuration of their experiment, and I'll get back to this uh, in a bit when I talk about our uh, numerical simulations. So uh, their quantum computing chip has 53 working qubits, and they performed the task uh, with a circuit EPS20, and they achieved the multi-qubit uh, fidelity of 0.02. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, the, in their experiments, they are not using uh, the traditional like quantum fidelity as their metric. Instead, they are using the linear uh, cross-entropy benchmark. There's some difference, and I, I'll uh, talk about this uh, in a later slide. So apart from the amazing uh, experiment they've done, uh, they also really tried to um, improve the classical simulation algorithms. And with their, uh, uh, with their best classical simulation algorithm, um, they are able to uh, do an extrapolation and predict that it will take 10,000 years to, for a classical computer to finish a similar task. So there's a drastic difference from uh, like a couple of seconds using a quantum computer um, and 10,000 years using a classical computer. That's why they said um, they've already realized the uh, quantum supremacy. However, um, just a couple of days later after the pub uh, they published their uh, paper, the Google group published their paper, the IBM group published um, another uh, preprint saying that it takes only a couple of days to perform such a task using state-of-the-art classical uh, supercomputers. So this naturally uh, leads to the question, uh, what is the true difficulty of simulating a quantum computer? And thus, now here we are asking what actually limits the simulation of quantum computers. So before uh, I get into our exploration, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about the previous works on uh, classical simulation. So there has been a long history of uh, doing classical simulations of quantum circuits because uh, in order to benchmark quantum the quality of quantum devices, we really need to have uh, like a way to tell how good the uh, samples generated from the quantum chips are. So people are trying to uh, use classical simulations to generate the exact result at like an answer key to compare with their uh, new quantum devices. So uh, the bottom line is that all these classical simulation works um, scale exponential algorithms scale exponentially with some parameters. Um, it can be the number of qubits, uh, the circuit depths, and some of them are like designed for specific type of uh, quantum circuits. So it can say scale exponentially uh, with respect to the number of non-Clifford gates within that quantum circuit. Um, and another important thing is that all these classical simulations focused on doing exact simulations or uh, drawing samples from the exact uh, distribution. However, we know that quantum computers have a finite fidelity. So what about um, we be, can we be like less harsh on the classical um, devices? And can we do approximate classical simulations by which I mean, we also use uh, by using classical computers, we also just get a 
resulting state with uh, fidelity smaller than one. So now let me uh, sketch out our uh, simple approximate quantum circuit simulation, uh, which is based on the um, TVD algorithm that is uh, widely used in many body uh, simulations. So in order to do a approximate quantum circuit simulation, um, there are two main parts. One part is uh, how to uh, approximate the quantum state and uh, another thing is how to run the circuit approximately. So let me start with uh, showing you how to get an approximate representation of the quantum state. So the goal here is to uh, the goal here is to approximate a uh, state in the quantum computer with n qubits, and if we write it in in the uh, computational basis, we the the in the classical memory we are trying to store a amplitude tensor, which is a style uh, with indices q1 all the way up to qn. Um, this tensor scales, the size of this tensor scales exponentially with the number of qubits. Um, but we know that some basis states are, um, more important than others. So the idea is here is that, uh, we can keep important states and, um, discard the less important, um, basis states. So I see there is a message in the chat window. I guess that's from, from Paul. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, maybe I, I messed up the timeline of what, what happens first. Yeah, but but based yeah. But the uh, uh it's just a couple of days between IBM posting the claim and the uh, uh, Google group publishing their um, quantum supremacy paper. So there's like kind of a dramatic difference between their two estimates. Yeah, so I'll proceed probably. Okay, so the idea here is, here is that we, uh, we will try to use the tensor network states to uh, realize the approximation of quantum states. And in this work specifically, we are uh, trying to use the matrix product state um, shorthanded MPS, uh, which is the, the 1D case of uh, tensor network state. Okay. Um, so first I'd like to take a little uh, detail to introduce the tensor networks and show you how the how, uh, show you a little bit about the uh, tensor network diagrams because in the later discussion I'll use this kind of diagram a lot. So for a uh, order zero tensor, which is the simplest case, which is just a scalar, um, in, in the tensor diagram uh, picture, which I just represented as a uh, one node with no edges pointing out, and the second simplest thing is the uh, a vector which is vi with one index and that can be represented by one node with one edge pointing out and then we have also have matrix which has two index or we can generalize it into a higher order uh, tensor which say here is a one tensor with five indices so it, in tensor diagram it's represented by one node with five edges pointing out and uh, a tensor network is just a like a set of um, tensors uh, connected, like uh, multiplied in certain ways. As a concrete example here, um, I'm showing uh, one uh, tensor tensor multiplication where we multiply a tensor A with four indices IJKL with B uh, another tensor with three indices KLM. And uh, by using like implicit Einstein notation, we are like going over two indices K and L. So in tensor network, diagram picture, we have one uh, tensor A, one tensor B, and the common indices are like connected. So after doing the uh, multiplication, the, the common edges are like annihilated and we only left with one tensor with uh, the open edges connected to the node. And this is the CIJM tensor. 
So uh, using this picture, when, since like when we have lots of tensors, it will be uh, easier to visualize what's going on uh, with these tensor uh, operations. So let me just remind you what's the goal um, I just mentioned in a previous slide. We are trying to uh, represent this uh, amplitude tensor psi, Q1 all the way up to Qn. And in the tensor network diagram uh, picture, it's just one node connected with uh, tons of edges. The question is how to, can we uh, compress this tensor? So, uh, the like standard practice to do the tensor approximation is via uh, singular value decomposition, where um, when we do the singular value decomposition, we start with a uh, matrix, say, psi AB with two indices, and we can decompose this, it into this format where U A mu and V mu B are two uh, unitary matrices, and S mu is the uh, singular value vector. To, perform the approximation, what we do is we uh, sort the singular value um, vector where we put the largest singular value at the top and uh, the smallest ones at the bottom. So before doing any approximation, we got a uh, long singular value vector, which it has chi four number of um, elements in it. And uh, to do the approximation, we choose uh, to keep only chi uh, singular values and discard the uh, smaller ones. So we keep the top chi uh, entries within that vector and discard all those smaller singular values. Um, so here uh, we are summing from mu goes all the way from one to chi. And we can take an extra step where we multiply the u uh, a mu with s mu to have this um, absorb the singular values into one side of uh, one of the unitary matrix. This, this uh, extra step is not um, doing anything uh, like more approximation or anything, but just it's uh, useful when we are trying to maintain the matrix product state uh, format. So uh, in the tense diagram picture, uh, what we have is initially we have this style AB and we do the singular value decomposition, which get, gives us two uh, matrices with this bound decorated with the singular value spectrum. To do the approximation, we replace with this, uh, replace this uh, singular value spectrum with a uh, truncated version, which only has uh, chi entries in, in this decorator, and we absorb this it into um, the left-hand side. Can I so, ask a question? Yep. So uh, on the previous slide, I, can you go back to the previous slide for a second? Uh, maybe a slide before this one. Yeah, so now psi has many indices. It has n indices, um, which each take on the values 0 and 1. Um, and so you reshaped it so that it has two indices. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, is there, well, anyway. I just wanted to point that out. Oh, so, so here uh, I'm just showing for like, if I want to do a bipartite uh, singular value decomposition, I, I can on, like, I can group the multiple indices into two groups, say A and B and uh, perform the singular value decomposition. And we can do like further singular value decompositions within each group. And that, that's like, hope, hopefully in the next slide, it will, uh, things will be clear. Um, so we, we can perform a sequence of such kind of singular value decomposition uh, where we uh, perform one singular decomposition and pull out one qubit, uh, like one index. And then uh, we do that again uh, until all the, all the way until we have uh, one physical index um, attached to one side of MPS, where here, this is the uh, matrix product state format. Does okay, that... so that, so this makes sense now. So, so in the first step here, Q two for Q n will become one collective index. So, so that thing is your is right. Your, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, is there any further questions? So, um, I have a question. So, does it matter? <clears throat> 
uh, which way you do the partition to arrive at the final um, configuration like instead of doing q1 to uh, you can cut it in the middle and keep cutting in the middle and so on so does that matter um i guess you can do a like binary tree thing then you can get some parallelism by doing that but um like if you are doing it sequentially okay um, I haven't really think about this because typically we start with something with really small entanglement and like we don't do truncation initially, but yeah, I believe there can be tricky ways where uh, different orderings might matter. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't need to think about this more. Um, then maybe I'll continue on then. So um, one question is why uh, we, we might bother to do all these singular value decompositions and or try to maintain this kind of matrix product, matrix product state format. The advantage of this format is actually that um, it drastically uh, reduces the computational complexity. So if we try to keep the uh, state as a whole huge uh, tensor, then the memory or the computational complexity um, scales exponentially with respect to the number of qubits. But if we use the um, matrix product state form, it scales only polynomially in M. And uh, the controlling parameter of MPS is this, the, the so-called bound dimension, which is this chi. Um, and at, if we allow the chi to grow exponentially all the way up to uh, two to the n, then um, the MPS can uh, represent any these kind of um, tensors exactly. So hereby I've shown that um, we can do control the compression of a quantum state via um, representing it into the set. Uh, MPS form. So let's turn to the other side, which is uh, how to run a circuit approximately. So to do the, um, here we consider two type of uh, gates. Uh, the first type is the single qubit gate and the second is the two qubit gate. Um, uh, for the two qubit gate, we only consider the case where it uh, like applies to neighboring qubits. Um, the single qubit gate is relatively um, easy where uh, we can perform it exactly because you can just think of a single qubit gate as a matrix acting on one of the qubits. Like this, each side is just one node pulling out from the uh, MPS chain. And we do the multiplication where we absorb this uh, single qubit gate in. In, into the qubit and we got an updated state and we put it back into the um, MPS. Um, however, for the two qubit gate seems uh, are a little bit more, um, it's more complicated and we um, need to do approximation in order to um, prevent the uh, required memory or the bound dimension from blowing up. So for the two qubit gate, you can think of it as a uh, wider block that acts on two uh, nearest neighboring qubits. And if we do the simple contraction or like multiplication, what we get is the two um, qubits actually get uh, fused together uh, as represented by this gracing. And we can do the singular value decomposition to try to put it back into the uh, MPS format. However, um, w once we um, have lots of multiple uh, two qubit gates acting on the same pair of two qubit gates, the entanglement blows, uh, grows up and the uh, bound dimension required to represent the, uh, the state exactly will grow um, exponentially. So eventually we will want to do truncation, which is that uh, singular value decomposition approximation trick I just showed um, to make sure the uh, bond dimension still uh, remains in a uh, like acceptable um, size. So that's where uh, the, so, uh, the error comes, um, wh where the uh, source of error in our um, approximated simulation al algorithm comes from. Okay. 
So here, um, after this, this point, I have showed you how uh, a quantum state can be um, compressed and like approximated by an MPS. And I, I've also showed how the gate application is realized in our um, algorithm. It's worth point, pointing out that um, this algorithm scales linearly in a uh, number of qubits and circuit depths, which is similar to what's happening in the uh, actual quantum devices. And the uh, uh, error actually uh, comes from the um, application of gates. And as you get more, uh, apply more gates on, onto the state, you, you get more error. This is like comparable to what's happening in realistic quantum devices. So now we are trying to apply uh, our algorithm to a task to benchmark how well uh, this algorithm works. And the task is motiva motivated from the uh, quantum supremacy experiment, which is a random quantum circuit experiment. Um, so here, let, let me bring back uh, the Google supremacy um, experiment setup where um, in that uh, Sigma chip, they have a 2D connectivity, which means uh, on, on a square grid, which means uh, each qubit is connected to four nearest neighbors. And in their experiment, they considered one qubit gates randomly chosen from these three type of gates. And they have a fixed two qubit gate named um, iSwap gate. The circuit structure is designed as uh, following. They have one layer, uh, so, there, because one qubit is connected to four nearest neighbors, the four links are um, labeled into four groups, A, B, C, D. Um, so they apply, first apply one random, uh, one layer of random single qubit gates, and then they run one uh, layer of two qubit gates coupling the A, group A of the uh, nearest pair of nearest neighbors. And then they apply another layer of single qubit gate, then they couple the B group of nearest neighbors, then followed by a single qubit gate, then C group, single qubit gate, D group. And they, uh, they, they have a pattern of A, B, C, D, and C, D, A, B, which they found to be um, the most effective in uh, building up entanglement and like posing extra challenge to classical simulation. So the, the uh, random quantum circuit task may not be like, um, maybe very different from what a realistic uh, quantum algorithm look like, but the goal is to build up entanglement rapidly and try to demonstrate um, the advantage of quantum computers. So it's designed to be hard to simulate classically. Um, so in our numerical simulation, we first started with uh, the 1D connectivity uh, where like the qubits are confined on a chain and they can talk to their uh, nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors. And uh, so here you can, uh, the qubits are, here is an example of like seven qubit system, uh, one all the way up to seven. And we also uh, do something similar to what's done in the Google supremacy experiment where we apply uh, one layer of a uh, single qubit gate followed by um, two qubit gates on even pair or uh, sorry, it's odd pair of uh, neighboring qubits. Then we apply another layer of single qubit gate followed by an, uh, two qubit gates coupling the remaining even uh, pair of qubits. So uh, we repeat this pattern um, to get to like larger depths. So the single qubit gate we considered are slightly different from what's uh, done in, in the actual experiment. Here we use the uh, random unitary rotation, single qubit rotation. And for the two qubit gates, we considered um, control Z, control X and I swap. And the main, we mainly focused on control Z and that's like different from what's uh, used in I swap. And uh, it's also slightly easier to simulate because it's a, uh, control Z has two non-zero uh, singular values while I swap has four. Um, and in the later numerical results, we have a, a comparison between these two type of gates. Okay, so here, let me uh, show you the results of uh, our 
ap applying our um, algorithm to the 1D quantum circuit I just introduced. So the first thing uh, I'd like to mention is that um, in order to compare uh, the two, two states, the first thing we need to decide is the choice of uh, metric. How, how can we tell uh, the quality of our simulation result and the exact um, with respect to the actual um, exact resulting state? Um, possible choices include like the uh, multi-qubit fidelity or the cross entropy benchmark. And uh, in our numerical results, we mainly focus on the uh, multi-qubit fidelity. And we have a short comparison like uh, investigation into uh, the comparing the multi-qubit fidelity with the uh, linear cross entropy benchmark used in the Google experiments. And um, in, in the this specific random quantum circuit case, the fidelity is um, relatively more sensitive to error compared with the cross entropy benchmark. And if you are interested in more details, you can um, look into our uh, manuscript. You, you couldn't compute the fidelity unless you know what the exact answer is, correct? You mean in our classical calculation? For your, for your simulation, mm -hmm. you also need to be able to simulate it classically to compute the fidelity, correct? Yeah, so later, uh, like in one or two slides, I'll show you how, how we do that. So we actually find a way to avoid uh, calculating the exact um, state, uh, quantum state. And that, that actually enables us to uh, get into really large uh, number of qubits. So first, I, uh, th does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first, um, it's just a reminder that uh, the main source of error, uh, the, or I should say the only source of error of our um, algorithm are, comes from the application of two qubit gates. So first, um, let me show you the definition of two qubit gate fidelity, which is um, the CZ, uh, which is the control, control D gate we focus on, um, applied to the state after uh, applying n uh, minus one two qubit gates. So essentially the CZ times the state is the perfect resulting state after applying the nth two qubit gate. And we um, calculate the overlap with the approximated resulting state after that gate application. And um, we, we take the norm square to, which gives us the two qubit gate fidelity. So um, th there is a very nice and neat thing about uh, matrix product state, which is it has a so-called so canonical form, which enables us to uh, directly calculate the two qubit fidelity by just looking at the singular value vector. Um, I, I won't get into detail about how this canonical form um, was, was derived, but um, the bottom line is uh, basically we can get the two qubit gate fidelity for free because when we do a singular value decomposition, we already have the uh, singular value um, vector. So the next question is like it had already mentioned, like how, how can we get the uh, multi-qubit fidelity? So the definition of multi-qubit fidelity is- Sorry, uh, could you go uh, back to the previous slide for a moment? Yeah. Uh, in that formula for Fn, where is the n dependence in that quotient? Oh, so this is the n is like a application of the n. Yeah, I understood that you had up to n minus one and then the nth one, but in the right hand side of your formula for f of n, uh, I don't see where that n dependence is. In other words, what are the su and what are the s mu's in this case? Oh, the s mu's are the singular values. Of what? Uh, so. Well, after you apply the nth two qubit gate, you got a, a fused two side into that gray gray shape, uh, this thing. And when, when we do the singular value decomposition, we got a, uh, got, got the singular value uh, vector. And that's the S. And indeed this does, does not really have a N uh, 
dependence, but I just want to be consistent with uh, this is the same thing as then. So the the, S, so the, S, so the the singular values there have an implicit n dependence because uh, they result from n minus one previous fusions. Oh, that's because we are doing random quantum circuit. So after a certain no, well, no, I was asking a question. I understand that these are random, although of course you 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 fix the randomness and measure multiple times in practice, but. I just want to get a better feeling for what these uh, S's are result from the decomposition of what exactly. Okay, so uh, I see your point that you, you are saying uh, the n minus one, um, the psi n minus one depends on n minus one other like approximations, but the thing is. Uh, because it's it is a random quantum circuit, the you can just think of this psi as a just some some random uh, some some state from a random ensemble. So the it does not have a memory of what the other n minus one truncation uh, like approximation were. So when doing uh, in, in this formula, we can just look at the n's application and that one SVD. Just based on that one SVD, we can uh, calc and we got the singular value spectrum, and we use this formula. We can calculate the two mm -hmm. gigabit so, that let, let, um, I'm getting closer. Uh, maybe it would help me. Um, what is the size of the matrix that you're performing SVD on in this case? Um, the size also doesn't matter. It's like uh, if the if the size is like very small, then it's like very discrete. Then things will be different. But typically, when when we get to say one one thousand, um, it's just almost almost in the continuum limit, and things don't really uh, matter. In turn, uh, I'm trying to understand in terms of. Um, you know, the, the, the depth of the circuit you're at, which is characterized by n, or in terms of the total number of qubits, mm -hmm. uh, a matrix that you're decomposing and taking singular values of has some dimensions, m by some n. What, what are those dimensions of the matrix in terms of the depth and the width of the circuit? Um, so the, the first thing is, for MPS, we allow the bound dimension to grow a bit before we actually perform any truncation. Uh, uh, it's like in, in later results, uh, I also mentioned this, but I probably should, should talk about this a little bit earlier. But after, at the, by the point where we start to do the truncation, the state is well in the Porter Thomas limit. So, um, and that, that's just one thing. Uh, the second thing, no, to you, answer, you answer your- this, you, I'm sorry, you said this, uh cat on the right was exact and not subject to any truncation, if I understood correctly. It's, um, it, the, it's exact in the sense that the CZ was applied onto the state exactly. Sorry, this, this can be confusing. Um, it's the control Z state is applied to psi truncated and minus one exactly. Oh, I see. So the T was, uh, that was, the, that, uh, that explains my, my confusion. So yes, the, the T in both cases meant uh, truncated on both the bra and the cat, but I was yeah. misled by the perfect result and assumed that the right hand wasn't truncated. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. To sorry, um, I wasn't able to make this really clear. Okay, uh, so maybe I should, does this answer the, this uh, SMU question? Um, uh, you should keep going and eventually it should become clarified. Okay. Um, um, can I ask a quick question about the previous? So, so this, uh, so the sum, uh, like the, not, the, um, the numerator runs, runs from one to chi and then the, the denominator runs from one to two chi. So I'm guessing like um, the, the, the two chi is chosen like because it's like a sufficient thing, like it doesn't have to be a full sum or yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. The, the, so 
Control Z has two non-zero singular values. So after applying the CZ onto that state, it blows the bond, like doubles the bond dimension or doubles the number of non-zero singular values. So it goes from one to two chi, but we only want to keep chi singular values. Oh, I see. I so see. That, that's so this, two chi, this two chi is a meaningful number. Like it's not just, you know, it's not just that yeah. another approximation you're making. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So it's just um, every time you, once the uh, every time we apply the uh, CZ gate on, onto onto this side, it, it will um, double the number of non-zero singular values. And if we just let it go, it will grow exponentially. But we want we will do ex, uh, truncation every time to keep only chi of them. Okay, so let me continue. I think yeah. So now on onto uh, multi-qubit fidelity. Uh, the definition of multi-qubit fidelity is uh, the we are taking the overlap of the truncated simulation result with the perfect simulation result. By which we mean at e each step, we are, none of the step um, is uh, approximated. All of them are done exactly. Uh, but the, one immediately sees the problem that in this definition, the perfect simulation result uh, was involved. So the it, but we know the exact simulation is very expensive and we cannot get over like 20 ish qubits uh, with a laptop. So can we get multi qubit fidelity from uh, two qubit gate fidelity? The answer is fortunately, um, yes. Um, at least for this random quantum circuit case, the answer is yes. So uh, here again, I am restating the definition of multi qubit fidelity and um, if, if we think about what's going on with this, this uh, like brick block uh, random common circuit structure, so you will, you will see that the, um, as the error accumulates, we would expect the fidelity uh, to be multiplicative. And this is like, up to this point, this is just an hypothesis. So we guess this Fn can be approximated by, we just multiply all the uh, two qubit gate fidelities together. So we, we justify that this is a good approximation by performing a numerical simulation on a 20 qubit uh, system where we can still access this uh, perfect or exact simulation result. So um, in this plot, the markers are uh, from it, uh, the overlap of truncated and exact simulation results, which is um, the definition. And the lines are from uh, using this uh, our hypothesis formula, where we just when we run the circuit, we record all the uh, two qubit fidelities and we multiply them together to get this uh, curved data. So we can see basically the, the markers and the curve are uh, match very, match very well. So this is a great news because that means we can do large scale like large number of qubits uh, and large depth simulation and still um, evaluate the accuracy of our um, simulation. I'm, I'm impressed that it worked quite that well. Yeah, and th this actually uh, really is because it's a random quantum circuit for a like really structured quantum state. Um, if we just blindly do the truncation, it, it will likely be a disaster. <laughs> um, So there's actually a, a couple of other observations we can make from um, this figure. The first thing to notice is um, there's an initial plateau um, at, in, in each uh, curve. So this, this initial plateau is just um, comes from the fact that the, it takes a couple uh, a certain circuit depths to get the bond dimension saturated. And um, another thing to notice is that um, the, in the large circuit depth region, the, the curve actually falls onto a almost uh, straight line. And because it's um, plotted in a log scale, that means the fidelity drops exponentially with the circuit depth or the number of qubits. And this uh, resembles uh, what's happening in real quantum computers. 
and if some of you might take a really close look at this curve and compare uh, the different markers, uh, like different colored curves, and you see that from uh, bound dimension 10 to 20 to 50, we are get pushing up the curve quite a bit. So uh, one might be interested, like how far can we push up the curve? And because if we can push the curve all the way up to almost flat, then that means we are getting a really good um, simulator and we can uh, simulate like really large circuit depths uh, with a really high fidelity. So we did simulations on uh, various circuit depths um, and there, there's like both, there's, there's both good news and bad news. So if we look at the shallow, shallow circuits, which is uh, this blue curve, we can see when we increase the bound dimension, um, the, the error here we are sorry here we are plotting the um, average uh, two cubic gate error which is one uh, minus the two cubic gate fidelity uh, so for shallow circuits which is represented by this blue curve when we increase the bound dimension we see an uh, obvious drop in error which means we are getting higher fidelity by increasing the bound dimension However, this thing is actually uh, comes from the finite size effect because when we do the averaging, we are taking the initial plateau into account. And if the circuit depth is not uh, that deep, the initial plateau is playing a much like very important role in um, the averaging process. So if we get to deeper circuits, which- Sorry, uh, Are those, are those uh, ends in the legend, the number of qubits? Yeah, yeah, n is number of qubits, d is circuit depth. So uh, for deeper circuits, which is uh, depth 100, is re which is represented by uh, this middle two um, red and uh, purplish curves, we can see uh, the, the, the uh, drop is much more slower. And we also extrapolated the uh, infinite limit by which we, uh, when we do the averaging, we are only averaging over data points on this uh, dropping region. And we ignore the, like we discarded the plateau data points. That gives us the like infinite circuit depth uh, limit result. There, are, uh, which is shown in these two uh, black curves. There's both good thing and uh, bad thing we can see from, from these two curves. The good thing is that we can get a pretty high uh, or high fidelity or low um, er error rate with a uh, relatively small bound dimension. However, the bad news is that the fidelity saturates and even though we are like doubling the uh, bound dimension, the curve is not uh, going down as like fast as we hope. And we also uh, define this uh, saturated value to be um, the error rate um, subscript infinity. Right, so, so you're saying it, it didn't continue to decay exponentially, it saturated somewhere? Yeah. Why is that? So uh, you, you can think of it as, uh, I shouldn't say it's like actually Saturated and stops there. No matter how much oh. you put, like increase the. Is it be, is it is it because it's like fully depolarized or something, and so there's like a like fidelity won't actually drop all the way to zero. It'll drop to like one over the dimension of the Hilbert space or something. Uh, so um, one reminder is that I, I previously I said that MPS can represent any state exactly. Um, if I allow the bound dimension to grow as, as, as much as it wants. So I if I allow chi to be like infinity or a really huge number that, that's like needed to represent the state oh. exactly, then I, yes. I, I'm expected to get a error rate zero of that D1. So eventually this thing should go to, go, go to zero. But uh, the issue is the bound dimension is really grow exponentially. So like the, the slope is going down really, really slowly. And like, just with our eyes, we won't see it going down. 
and like it, it soon once the uh, system size gets large, like circuit depth get, gets deep, um, dumping into more bond dimension um, is, is not effective at all. Yeah, I have a question related to this. Um, mm -hmm. I think physically it makes sense that, you know, as you correctly, you certainly know this well that when Chi is, I mean, with the given data, probably two to the 60 or something, we mm -hmm. certainly get zero error. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's just that the slope is too small that, so that it's invisible, but does it really meaningful to define something called epsilon infinity? It, uh, meaning that is there really a plateau of some kind or is it just that it's a very, 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 uh, small slope that keeps going down. Uh, yeah, so uh, we define this epsilon infinity. That's because we are, uh, when, when we try to use, understand this, why th this thing like seems to saturate to, to a value, we use the uh, random matrix theory to um, do some numerical experiments. And we, we are trying to compare this epsilon infinity with um, something like, um, so th this plateau, well, we, we didn't explore what, what's the, like later on, there should be something different happening at the end, like it, it approaches zero, but at, at, at least for this, uh, at, at the beginning, we should see a plateau going on for a while. And that, that plateau um, can be compared with what's predicted if we purely use random um, tensors without considering it's a, like the state is coming from a random circuit. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah. I am trying to say what I'm trying to say is the existence of this plateau is not a coincidence. Coincidence. That's because the random circuit really scrambles the state and makes the state structureless. So we we can just um, we can uh, understand this from a random matrix theory perspective. What we did is we uh, draw tensors from the, so we set the ten, Gaussian tensor ensemble, which is basically each element within that tensor was drawn um, from this distribution. And we can like for sure that it's understood as it, it's a, just a random tensor. Um, so we apply the two cubed gate um, to a matrix drawn from that Gaussian tensor ensemble and do SVD to inspect the singular values, uh, like spectrum distribution of the singular values. Um, what, what we see is that if uh, we apply a control Z gate onto a, like that random tensor drawn from that ensemble, uh, and we do the SVD to see the sing singular uh, value spectrum, Here's what, what we observe. Um, we can see there are two bundle of curves, which are for two type of gates. One is the uh, two cubic gates with two non-zero singular values. And the other, uh, the, the other one is for uh, two cubic gates with four non-zero singular values. So we can like basically classify the two, those two cubic gates into two uh, groups and also getting back to one of the questions. Uh, increasing bound dimension can be understood as going to a continuum limit uh, when, when we compute the uh, two, qubit, two qubit gate fidelity. So when, when we use this, this formula to do a two qubit gate fidelity, what we are doing is that we are uh, summing over, we are like cutting off the singular value spectrum and doing a summation um, over the larger part and discard the tails. But if we allow the bond dimension to um, grow, what we are doing is actually uh, increasing the resolution at the cutting point, but it doesn't really uh, change the thing once the uh, bond dimension is large enough. So if we get a, like infinite bond dimension, which means we are going to a continuum limit, we have an infinite resolution at the uh, cutting point when we uh, cut this, uh, deciding where, which, at which point we want to discard the uh, sing smaller singular values. This uh, discrete sum becomes a uh, continuous integral. And um, here, this gx is just uh, a function representing this distribution. 
we don't have an analytical like expression for what exactly this uh, function is, but we know that because these two bundles have a like, we can see they have a certain shape. So we, we are just saying, okay, there exists a function GX that represents a distribution. And we are basically doing the, um, we can get, get a prediction of what's the uh, fidelity we can get by uh, using this continuous uh, continuum limit formula. So uh, what we got by using this formula, what we got is uh, for control Z and control X gate, control X gate, which is rank, rank two gates, uh, the fidelity is 96.2%. And for I swap gate, which is um, the experiment, the gate using the experiment and has uh, rank four, the fidelity is uh, slightly lower uh, and it gets to 93.2%. Yeah, and, and uh, I've got to mention, um, like in this continuous formula, the this formula is independent of the bound dimension chi. That's why um, we are seeing like when we double the bound dimension, we are not actually seeing uh, much effect because of um, using this thing. We can see uh, in, in this region at least it's independent of the bound dimension. So um, on the previous slide, shouldn't the shouldn't the fidelis go to one as the bond emission goes to two to the n? Uh, yes. Like not not in, uh, the, the slide afterward after that. Here. Or here. No. Yes, that one. Yeah. Like you said, you said like this this fidelities are independent of bond emission chi, but as chi goes to two to the n, the fidelity should go to one. Oh, uh, I'm saying like. In the, in the middle, say I uh, have bound dimension uh, 1,000 and I apply a two cubic gate, it becomes 2,000. Two and then I do the truncation, uh -huh. get it back to 1,000. The result is not that different from I keep like 10,000 and it gets to 20,000 and I truncate it back to 10,000. Like these two gives a similar result. Okay. So, okay. So there is like, there's like some order of this is there's some reasonable order of magnitude you have in mind for a chi that is not 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 infinite i guess um, yeah but like but it, things will be different say the actual full rank is uh 10000 and i'm keeping say uh 10000 versus 500 that's a uh, very different right okay that's yeah but but that's like if we got two to the 64, then we are keeping like two to the, we need to keep two to the 63 or more to make that difference. But like, that, that's not feasible. Right, right. So just to make sure that this calculation using random matrix theory is in the limit where mu is much, much smaller than the matrix dimension. Is that right? Essentially, uh, yes. mu mu over n, n being the matrix dimension is zero, I, I suppose. Yes, so it, it's much less than the full rank. Okay. Yeah, so we also uh, compared with, uh, compared this then the matrix result uh, with uh, the actual circuit simulation. So uh, we compare the, the colored lines um, are from uh, the matrix circuit simulation, which we apply uh, like a circuit with depth 60 and for on a 30 um, qubit system. And after running that simulation, we take out one of the uh, two of the sides and perform the uh, two qubit gate and uh, SVD thing to get the singular value spectrum. That's what we, where these colored lines comes from. And the dashed line comes from, uh, we, we uh, instead of running circuits and like taking two sides from, from the random circuit uh, resulting state, we just draw two random samples from the Gaussian tensor ensemble and do the same thing. And we can see uh, the, the curves are uh, really close together, which means um, the random matrix theory we are seeing, the an analysis we got here, um, sh should be quite ap applicable to uh, the MPS circuit simulation. Yiqing, mm -hmm. uh, I actually have to run out. 
Okay. So I just made you a host. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I will do this because you're you know you're in the group. So and okay. and you seem to be fending yourself just fine. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> so I'll watch the rest on a recording later. Okay. Then I'll continue to the. To the quantum circuit part. Um, up, up to this point, I've shown all the, all the results we've got for the 1D quantum circuit simulation, and um, people are probably much very interested in what's, what what will happen with the 2D case because the actual uh, quantum uh, computing chip, the Sycamore chip, has a 2D connectivity. So we also try to uh, apply this algorithm to the 2D um, like geometry. So this, the first thing to like comes to mind is just do the standard way to map the 2D grid onto a 1D chain. Like we snake through uh, the 2D uh, grid and make it onto a 1D chain where we have one, two, three, four, five, then we, we get um, six, seven, eight, nine, like put them onto a chain. So the immediate like downside of doing this kind of trick is uh, we have some two qubit gates that's local on the two uh, 2D chip becomes non-local in our 1D chain. For example, this one and six is uh, local on this uh, 2D grid, but when we look at our MPS, it's like separated by the other four qubits. Um, the, the easiest thing to do is to use swap gate to bring the uh, two qubits um, into nearest neighbors on the MPS. But that means we, we are applying multiple two qubit gate um, in order to realize one physical like two qubit gate. So that, that also means we have multiple uh, truncation happening uh, per two qubit gate and the effective fidelity just drastically um, drops down. So in order to get beyond uh, the epsilon infinity that, that plateau I just mentioned, um, the first thing is to, is to avoid truncation. And what we can do is to group multiple qubits into one side uh, in MPS. And that in effectively internalizes some of the two qubit gates. So that some, when uh, we reduce the number of approximations we need to um, in running that circuit. So by group multiple qubits into one side, I mean, um, like now each side of MPS actually has multiple uh, indices representing qubits um, attached to it. So for example, initially when we have one site per uh, uh, one, one index per site or one qubit per site, th this type of two qubit gate is, um, needs, appro needs approximation because when, when we uh, want to maintain the MPS form, we, we are doing truncation. But for uh, once we group the multiple qubits into one, this uh, type of two qubit gates is actually um, exact. And another thing we can do is uh, we can, because of the specific brick wall structure. Just to back a slide. Okay. Yep. Uh, why, on the bottom left, why mm -hmm. are there three vertical lines coming out instead of just. Oh, 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 never mind. So you've, you've grouped three qubits together in the second. In the second block. Yeah, I, I'm just saying like there, there's various ways you can think of to like groups the qubits. Like you, you can assign some uh, like five qubits into one node and like 10 on another, but th there is way to optimize like what's the best configuration that can minimize the cost. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because of the brick wall structure of the uh, random common circuit we got, there's some extra tricks we can do. Like we can shift between uh, different groups, um, different groupings. For example, we can initially group um, three columns into one, one node and we got three, 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 three. And we can shift to like five, two, five. And that, that means like we are, uh, we only do the sh shifting once like SVD once. And we can apply a whole column of two qubit gates exactly. Um, yeah, but, but, but that's like uh, just trying to make our uh, algorithm live longer. Huh. 
and th there's still um, challenges when, when things get to um, to um, to the structure. So here are the simulation results where uh, here I'm showing the simulation results of control Z um, two qubit gate uh, with 2D structure with 54 qubits because um, it's just easier to have 54 instead of um, manually like taking out one of the qubits. So we are just doing a 54 uh, qubit simulation. Um, so the in, in the figure, what, what's shown here is uh, we are presenting results from different groupings, like the one uh, with power 12 is essentially 11111, um, which means the uh, standard MPS with one qubit per site. Um, this is uh, essentially what the algorithms like without any um, further trick. And this is the cheapest because each, each uh, MPS side has the smallest size but it, it also requires much larger bound dimension to get a, a good fidelity. And we can also have a six six, which is like essentially the ha having only one, uh, only two, two sites each with like 20, 20, uh, seven, if I'm doing calculation, 27 qubits each site. And it's much more expensive, but the good thing is it's also much more affordable. So people can play around with the way they want to uh, group the qubits. And the best result we can we got is from the 4224 configuration. And that's like gets be below what's uh, achieved with the supremacy uh, ex experiment, um, which is uh, gate with two qubit gate fidelity 98.6%. And uh, just to point out that here, I'm ignoring the difference between uh, cross entropy benchmark and multi qubit fidelity we use. So, however, um, if we actually want to do uh, the- Sorry to, while, while you uh, have that up, sorry to interrupt again, but mm -hmm. um, you, you, I think you said the best was 4224. Yes. So but this- it looks, like, it looks like 66 does better. I think that it's the 525. Is yeah, the, it's like this blue. Green-ish or this this one, um, like depending on. Uh, Looks like the five two five gets lower. Oh, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was mis I was misreading the. I, I th thank you, Elliot. I meant to say the five two five. Yeah, um, but but they, they are uh, very close. The the thing is, the four two two four is the one that's like most economic and still gets below the curve. I see. Okay. You don't have a, a measure of the uh, economy on this plot. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, uh, well I guess the right. economy is just the smallest number of qubits that you have to group into one large thing, roughly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's like based on my impression. One one cannot really tell uh, whether this 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 dot small dot is like. E easier or this blue one is easier, but like my experience is on this one's easier because um, the five, five to five um, is like five columns. It's m much more painful com compared with uh, the four to two four configuration. Yep. Okay, for then let's get, get to the eye swap gate where uh, this is the rank four tensor. And uh, as I mentioned before, the two qubit gate fidelity predicted by the Gaussian tensor ensemble uh, like theory is like 3% lower compared with 3% ish lower compared with uh, the rank two uh, tensors, uh, rank two gates. So indeed here we see uh, things are harder than uh, the control D gate. And with the grouping only, we get an average gate fidelity of 95%, which is um, quite a bit away from the 98.6% uh, we would like to achieve. So uh, we added the shifting trick I mentioned, like where we uh, shift the configurations back and forth. Um, and that gets, uh, helps us to get the fidelity back to 98%. However, uh, we are still far, um, a bit away from getting to, not a bit, but 
quite a way from getting uh, the experimental fidelity, but we, we didn't like kind of extrapolation of we need around 10 to the fourth uh, bond dimension in order to reach to a point where we can get a similar fidelity compared with uh, the Google supremacy experiment. But why don't I see any points that are at 0.02 if you get a fidelity to 98%? Oh, well, we, we didn't really get here. Um, so the, the simulations we can uh, do runs all the way up to like here, but um, mm. it's like we, we are still, we are trying to estimate how large a bond dimension we need, but we didn't actually carry out the simulation. So, uh, but a, a couple comments on this, the, it's like that our, our algorithm is completely based on a uh, like evolution um, algorithm and we didn't have any uh, further, we didn't use any further tricks like either it's par parallelism of um, classical computing or uh, like numerical tricks to improve further, like further optimize the fidelity. So there are still ways to um, like improve uh, the sim classical simulation uh, results. And, and also at the same time, there's also some new uh, quantum computers coming out with larger system sizes, but maybe uh, like similar uh, fidelity, which I haven't really get look into details about um, like what what's the exact fidelity they got, but um, like the competition or maybe not competition, uh, the story is to be continued. Um, yeah, so up to this point, I've shown all the data we got um, and I'd like to uh, wrap up and uh, summarize the uh, what we learned from our exploration. Quick so, question on, on your simulation. So you said you were using uh, 54 qubits rather than uh, 53 because mm -hmm. you didn't feel like removing a random one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of the simulations were tied to the same architecture and same sort of, you know, that ABCD right. CDA configuration they were using? Yep. Okay. A uh, quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. So on the last slide, just to get a sense, like, uh, so the, the runtime with the, the matrix product state, it's, it's quadratic in chi, right? Uh, yes. And so the, like, at, when chi is, you know, I guess 100, what was the runtime, you know, just in serial without parallelization or anything? Uh, it's like always depending on uh, which configuration you have. Okay. So, so I mean, to extrapolate down to uh, 10 to the 4, would you have to like, multiply that by 10,000 or uh, assuming you don't parallelize it or like what would the runtime approximately so be? Because it scales with chi square, uh, and, and because like the for the MPS, it's a big old uh, notation. We we don't really know what's the prefactor, like like the constant prefactor in front of it. That that's also one uh, issue. But shouldn't it be like if you're increasing chi by a hundred, then shouldn't the runtime yeah. increase to like a hundred squared? Right. But like practically, uh, things are not going that way. Like we, we've done simulations down to that size, then like hardware limitation starts to um, kick in and, and we really need to do some parallelism to make things like affordable. At, at, at like 10 to the fourth, this, this kind of uh, bond dimension. I mean, the, the first question was, how, how long did it take to do the ones you did? And you said it depended on the state. But I mean, is it like a day, a week, an hour, a minute, order of magnitude? Always, or I, I would say a day, like always, okay. depending on like, it, it can be like 10 hours, 20 hours, but um, it's not not as long as a week or so. Um, Right. Uh, where was I? Um, so th does this answer answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.
we, we don't want to wait 10,000 days. Right, definitely. Uh, okay, so summary and conclusion, right? Uh, so basically here I uh, presented our MPS-based algorithm, uh, which enables approximate classical simulation. And the feature of this algorithm is, first it mimics the real quantum devices where it cost, the cost scales linearly with the number of qubits and circuit depths. And also um, it has a finite fidelity at each um, two qubit gate uh, operation. Uh, yeah, and for, sorry. Uh, for 1D random quantum circuits, we can reach a uh, fidelity of 99%, around 99%, 98.6-ish, um, 98.6 to be accurate. Then for the 2D random quantum circuits, the fidelity drops um, to 95%, but uh, we have like further tricks, for example, the shifting that can bring things back up. Uh, a bit, but still there's um, further room for um, improvements. So um, towards the end, I'd like to, uh, hopefully I've um, provided the answer to this question, what limits the simulation of quantum computers. And based on our exploration, our answer are first, um, fidelity is something that um, really a uh, high fidelity really poses challenge to um, classical simulations because if we got a fidelity that's lower than the sh threshold we show, then we can have a really cheap like classical simulator uh, that gives you a resulting state that with, with a desirable um, fidelity. So, but if you really um, have a high quality uh, quantum device that has a really high uh, fidelity, that, that will be um, really hard for people to like simulate at least use our algorithm, it's really hard to achieve. So are, are your results consistent with IBM's claim that they could simulate Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment? Uh, we didn't explore, like we didn't try to uh, reproduce what IBM said because they are doing exact simulations. Oh, I see. So what, what they, are, they are doing is they are uh, really try to um, do uh, push classical simulation like parallelism to a limit. They are trying to use the largest quantum uh, supercomputer and like not only use a uh, largest super classical supercomputer, but they, they need to use it in full. Like all other users need to be kicked out at the time and if they use that simulator, it takes days. So it's also impractical, I would say. Yeah, it, it, at the time, lots of people said, Wonderful, it, you know, John Martinez said, oh, wonderful, you know, it's great to see what these things can do. Please go ahead and do it. And two years later, they have not done it. Yeah, it's just really expensive to um, like ha completely occupy one um, super simple computers for days. And oh, yeah, uh, the second answer, uh, second part of our answer is the connectivity. So as we can see, the 2D connectivity is much harder than the uh, 1D connectivity to simulate. And um, it's really a pain when we try to uh, make our 1D um, simulator live longer to, to 2D. But yeah, it will be interesting to see uh, if we apply more uh, like optimization algorithms, like combine our simulation, uh, approximate simulation idea with uh, other like uh, optimization algorithms. What, um, whether we can get a better result or not. So with that, uh, I'll stop here and uh, bring, here's, again, here's the link to that paper. If you're interested, um, you can uh, take a look at the manuscript. And with that, uh, if there's any further questions, uh, I can take the questions. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. So, um... Did you like write all of this from scratch or did you use existing software packages to do the MPM? Uh, so I use the, I use the iTensor library, but uh, I use the uh, iTensor library in the level of, I used it as a uh, Einsam, hmm. alternative to Einsam in Python. Like, 
So the circuit simulator was written, rewritten and it's not uh, like basically it's used in, iTensor was used in a really low level. I see. Because I, I know that there, there are software packages that do this sort of thing. Like I know that like Kiskit's Chasm Simulator can do MPS simulations. Mm -hmm. I guess if you had done it that way, I don't know whether you would have been able to compute um, the two qubit fidelity the way that you did. Um, yeah, uh, th there's also a another work uh, I involved in a little bit, which is doing parallel tensor network contraction thing, but we we didn't try to um, apply uh, that 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 kind of uh, state of the art uh, classical algorithm when when we are doing this project because we are, we are trying to like explore uh, the the idea of doing a circuit approximation so. The goal here was not to like compete with anyone or like try to demonstrate uh, quantum supremacy is wrong or anything, but we are trying to highlight that uh, fidelity is something um, really important. There's a link in the chat. Oh, is there a chat? Okay. Oh, sorry, I just put the Pelican's bug and do that. Uh, here's the, the link. Actually, I do have a, another question. So uh, uh, you tested this idea that the true fidelity, uh, if you compare the perfect, perfect, uh, whatever quantum state with the, the truncated state, that's the, the true fidelity. But you have a, you uh, you you explain in onslaughts, so that it's just a product of you know these, uh, I forgot what they're called, but little f's, I guess. Yeah. Right yeah. Up here. Mm -hmm. So this. Uh, does it care about the connectivity of the network, or uh, when you do this, uh, these plot is it done specifically on a one D system, or uh, it, it doesn't matter? Uh, it it doesn't matter. We did a brief test on uh, like small two uh, D grid systems, and uh, things are consistent. But uh -huh. um, the the thing is, this this formula works specifically for uh, random quantum circuits, and it, it works well once the state does not have, have a like memory. If it's a state that has a memory, then just multiply the fidelity um, that doesn't, uh, will not be a good approximate to the actual multi-qubit fidelity. Uh-huh, I see. Uh, can I ask a quick question as well? So you just said, um, you, you said that like um, part of the message of this, of this work is, um, like the fact that fidelity is important. Um, so, so, ba so basically, that's that means something like, um, like achieving, like doing a quantum supremacy task with, uh, with a finite fidelity. Well, like if I, if fidelity is something you need to worry about when you when you're discussing quantum fidelity because there might be classical classical methods that can um, do quantum tasks um, quickly. You know, if if they're allowed to be at a at a lower you know at a lower fidelity. Yeah, uh, like uh, there has been lots of competition in like trying to scale up the quantum computer uh, in terms of uh, system sizes or trying right. to run really deep circuits, but people typically don't pay that much attention to what the quality of the resulting state. Right. So that, that's like the main message here. And, and typical and, and typical classical simulations will give exact exact um, right. exact results. Like they 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 don't equal like they don't. Um, like like to typically people when people simulate quantum circuits like they, they have an exact quantum circuit and then they try to add noise or de decoy or just something mm -hmm. but in, in a method like this where where you know where um it, it is an approximation um the, yeah. you're, so so the so the um loss of fidelity is kind of built into built into the method but mm -hmm. you're saying you might be able to do better than like an exact classical simulation by like giving up that fidelity and that's something to pay attention to when you're discussing quantum, quantum supremacy yeah, so initially the classical simulation is like a way to test whether a quantum device is good. So people like as a standard, people do exact simulations because we want to know the exact answer, uh, like result, the perfect state. And we use it as a way to like the standard to compare with um, the quantum computer results. But later here, now, once people try to demonstrate, say, quantum supremacy or any like quantum advantage, um, it's like we, we probably shouldn't uh, 
make, forcing the classical computers to do exact simulation seems to be unfair uh, in a sense. Yeah, makes sense. Could you go back to the 2D plot with the at the very end? Like, yeah. Oh, send on my slide. Uh, stop me when I guess good. Uh, uh, no, uh, yep. Yeah, I'll come back. Yeah. Uh, there. Okay. Um. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering because I mean, there. I mean, I I assume I, I don't know much about this, but I, I assume there are some kind of results that have been rigorously proven that when. Uh, you require the the computations to be exact. Uh, the classical computers, there's this you know exponential kind of divergence and how long it will take. Uh, so I'm just I'm just curious. I mean, if you extrapolate this line at the point when it hits you know perfect accuracy, is that you know the point where chi is maximally large, or uh, is there you know maybe some kind of uh you know effect where you know it, it follows this trend for some time but then as it gets closer and closer to zero it it, it you know gets you know flatter and flatter or what? yeah um th there should be like the curve will not go straight uh, all the way down but um the ho the hope here is that in this region uh we are uh assuming that it, it the curve will go straight for a while before it actually gets to uh the it starts to curve a bit um, at, at the very tail, because here the chi is um, much smaller compared with uh, the two to the number of uh, qubits in the system. Here it's like two to the 54. I see. Um, is there other questions? Yeah, I think that, that's it. Sorry for going over time. No um, problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a great very time. Thank you. Yeah. Stop sharing.